Alright, um, so agriculture, including of course a lot of crops that aren't necessarily food, uh, this is uh, cotton harvesting in, in Central Asia. Um, so when it comes to agriculture, as I said, uh, a lot of developmental theorists kind of talk about the invention of agriculture as being one of the kind of main steps of, of how places develop, mostly because well, before agriculture, you have hunting and gathering societies, right? And everyone is basically just working to, to get enough food to eat. Uh, the Guns, Germs, and Steel movies uh, kind of showed this pretty extensively. Um, if, if, you, if you watch those. <clears throat> uh, let's see. This is an example of some of the rice paddy fields that are, well, rice being one of the mainstays of agriculture. Um, rice cultivation is kind of an interesting thing because it's still a, a huge crop, but it takes uh, a lot more work uh, and it's difficult to, to mechanize, right? Uh, a lot of the big food crops, uh, the, the magic of, of their productivity is, um, well, once you, once you industrialize something and mass produce it, right, you decrease the costs. And so it's one of those double-edged swords where areas that are, have high rice cultivation, it's still very uh, person intensive rather than uh, you, it's difficult to, to uh, get um, industrialized processes in because uh, the parts tend to rust because you need so much sitting water for rice and you need people to be out there uh, usually work in the rice fields pretty constantly. So it's one of those uh, types of agricultural fields where it's not losing jobs as quickly as other areas of agriculture. Uh, but at the same time, that is limiting how much they've been able to increase the varieties and crops. Um, you know, the, the Green Revolution is a, is a topic in this chapter, the Green Revolution being, uh, well, I talked about it a little bit in the video, uh, being able to figure out uh, designing crops to grow better given the specific climates that they've been brought to because you know a lot of these crops like wheat started off from just one little region of the world right and now it's been brought around to, to just about the entire world grows crop of one variety or uh, wheat of one variety or another um, but wheat very easy to industrialize, very easy to have a lot of machinery so you can grow a lot. Uh, so areas of wheat cultivation, again, the actual jobs of farmers, uh, their salaries going down, populations are leaving and moving to cities. Um, but well, our final chapter is, is cities, so I guess we'll talk about a lot of that when we get there. Um, some specifics of different farming systems. extensive agriculture um, you know this is agriculture that is on kind of the best land that there is for agriculture uh, places with good soils that don't take a ton of uh, other inputs into it because the more inputs into it the more expensive it is right um, intensive agriculture as you can see high levels of labor or capital relative to the size of land uh, what that means is well, as these varieties have gone all, gone all over the world, uh, they're not quite adapted to plenty of climates. And so you have to use very often lots of uh, fertilizers. Very often these will be specialized for the crops. So you'll have to pay uh, for whoever is making that type. Uh, herbicides and pesticides and things to kill, you know, bugs and stuff. And all these things add costs um, to your final product. Uh, and very often intensive agriculture, well, when you look around the world, there's lots of farmers who can't switch into because uh, they just don't have the money for that. Because even uh, intensive agriculture, usually you need genetically modified seeds that, again, cost money. And most farmers around the world, their seeds that they use are seeds that are saved up from previous year's harvests, right? But if you're going to buy your, your whole, all your new seed <coughs> every year, that's a big expense uh, that a lot of people don't have. So that's kind of one of the main things stopping um, lots of areas from kind of developing and moving into intensive agriculture. 
uh, again, some other definitions. Uh, agriculture, subsistence agriculture. Uh, it's, you know, what it sounds like. You have people who are growing food for them themselves. Sometimes at a, it's at a community level. Um, it, that is uh, contrary to commercial agriculture where you're growing a bunch of food that is very definitely not for yourself, right? You might be just, you have a job on a farm uh, rather than having it be your own farm, right? And you want to, in commercial agriculture, you want to produce as much product as possible, right? For subsistence agriculture, well, you know how, how many you're feeding. Like, let's say it's your family. You know roughly how much food your family will need. And you might grow a little bit to sell on the side or something like that with sub, uh, subsistence agriculture. Uh, but not a ton. Not a ton. <clears throat> Um, so some, again, different types of agriculture, slash and burn agriculture, might have heard that before. Uh, it's one of those, it's one of those terms that is useful because it's very descriptive in its name. Um, but slash and burn agriculture, when it was done historically and among traditional societies, it is actually sustainable because it usually involves um, you know, let's say you got your whole, your whole rainforest, uh, and the rainforest, the soils in the rainforest tend to be poor because there's so much rain it leaches out nutrients. Um, so, well, if you, if you burn off a small part of the rainforest, and usually this is pretty easy because you'll have, uh, dry periods of time and you just cut it down and it will dry out relatively quickly and you set it on fire, um, and then the ash is your fertilizer for a year or maybe sometimes several years. And it will be a comparatively small amount of land that then you uh, allow to, to, you know, you move away after a few years and you find another area of land that's a good distance away. And that way, the kind of jungle mosaic comes back together uh, and, and rehabilitates that one area. So again, small scale and it has been done traditionally. Uh, it's sustainable, uh, but through time, the lots of land have gotten larger and larger, and it's more and more common for these areas of land to be put into commercial use, which needs larger areas of land. Um, and that type of slash and burn, uh, it just, well, the, the areas usually aren't allowed to go back to nature. What happens is uh, they'll be farmed for a number of years, uh, until the, the soil is depleted, and then you have one of two choices. You can keep growing food there, but you've got to pay for a bunch of fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides and various other things to keep it going. Or what actually, what I have found more common to happen is it goes into uh, grazing land. It becomes grazing land. People kind of to let it go back to nature, but because they, they use it as grazing, the trees never really come back because uh, you have animals that are, that are eating on that land. But that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, if you go to a Brazilian restaurant, it'll be a whole bunch of cuts of beef because um, they have a huge, huge uh, cattle industry uh, because so much of what had been the Amazon rainforest has been converted to grazing land. Um, slash and burn agriculture right it looks like what it sounds like right <clears throat> um i oh, already talked about rice farming a bit let's see if there's anything i forgot um well i didn't mention double cropping uh you know that just means you can pl plant twice a year some climates will allow that uh plenty don't um Let's see. There's a, a picture from the book. Um, and again, you see how it's pretty labor intensive. People have to really monitor their crop area. Um, they're kind of always in the process of either planting or pulling weeds or uh, maintaining the water levels have to be just right. Uh, involves a lot of work, involves a lot of work. Uh, and as I said, you could see of it as well. That's empl uh, employing farmers, right? These aren't populations that have all lost their jobs and had to move uh, to the cities looking for work. Um, there's a big air, uh, section on the 
end of this chapter about uh, rice terraces, uh, and specifically in China. Um, and I went to the area that is right by there. Uh, oh, this is a little, little blurred out. You can kind of see how the mountains are carved up there. Um, this area of China, have I shown you guys these ones before? Do you seem familiar? No? All right. Like I said, I get a strong sense of deja vu sometimes when I'm doing these lectures. Um, well, when I was there, actually, you could probably tell you, you don't see a lot of actual standing water like you did in the other pictures. Um, when I was there, uh, they, they said that it had been uh, pretty dry over the past several years. It had been uh, getting drier and drier, and so they've had to switch to other crops because it's too difficult to just maintain those level waters um, so far around. Um, I don't know if you can see there are these little carriers that tourists can pay to, to be carried around. Um, I didn't I don't want anyone to be carrying my, my heavy butt around so I did not pay for that. But it is a lot of climbing to go visit these areas. This is the crop that they had switched to that required a lot less water. Uh, it's just drying out. Um, I don't know if you guys eat a lot of Chinese food. Oh, this is one of those carriers. Uh, like I said, I, I didn't go for that, but some tourists did. Uh, in this area, the, you know, this, this little farming village had been here for like very, very many generations, like maybe a thousand years. Uh, and you can imagine how long it would take to carve out entire mountains to make them to increase your farming land. Uh, here's the crop that they're switching to, chilies, which uh, pound for pound in, in exporting them, uh, was giving them a, a more money than rice per se, especially since the rice is being more difficult to maintain, but as you see, this takes a lot less water, right? You don't need tons and tons of standing water. It's just a duck in the bus that we took. <clears throat> All right. Crop day system, cereal of root crop. Um. Let's see, what else can I say about cereal root crop farming? Uh, you know, this is another one that has been uh, switched into uh, industrial farming, right? Uh, mass produced, uh, kind of depends on the specific uh, type of crop. Uh, and lots of these crops have really had their ups and downs. Like oats, you know, oats used to be worldwide one of the kind of main, main crops out there, but then when we stopped using horses for everything, we all sort of needed a lot less, a lot less oats. Um, they're still grown quite a bit just because um, part of our book talks about how, especially in ancient cultures, they would mix crops together because you could have a crop that takes, for example, a lot of, a lot of uh, nitrogen out of the soil, right? Which is actually most crops. And it's like, well, if you plant one year something that's taking a lot of nitrogen out, and the next year you plant something like beans that puts nitrogen back in, well then you you kind of have this stable, stabilizing thing going on. Uh, lots of ancient societies, they would actually plant these things at the same space too, but that would, of course, you couldn't do that with machinery. Usually that, that involves people monitoring and you need to have kind of the different levels growing at the same time. <clears throat> uh, it's where do we still use the word peasant, but I suppose. Um, there's, with all the stuff going on in Ukraine and Russia in the news, I don't know if you guys have been picking up that there's a bit of a, uh, a international food emergency situation that's emerging because crops need to be planted pretty soon. Um, and that specific area that is in war right now of Ukraine and Russia and the areas that are all surrounding where all this stuff is going down um, are, are the breadbasket of actually 
the most of the, the poorer countries of the world. They, they buy their wheat from that region. And so, like I said, there's a big worry right now because it's a huge amount, huge amount of wheat um, that may or may not be planted and then that may or may not be harvested. Uh, plantation agriculture. Um, I know sometimes students can be confused if they're, you know, like traveling to somewhere and, and they're told that there is a, a plantation somewhere because that word is so associated with the history of slavery. Um, they're still called plantation agriculture, even though it's for wages now. Um, not for very, very high wages, uh, but it is wages. Um, let's see what else I could say about plantation agriculture. I could show you an example. This is just a picture from the book uh, of a banana plantation in Costa Rica. Um, I went to Costa Rica and got some, some pictures of some of the crops. Uh, I don't know if you could tell what, what crop this is. Slightly closer picture. Uh, these are pineapples. This is how pineapples grow. People kind of picture them up on trees like an apple, but uh, they, just, they just grow out of the ground. Uh, this is banana uh, plantation, similar to the picture from the book. Um, this is uh, a series of, well, actually, let me go forward to one picture. So you, you notice the bags on them. Uh, the system they have going, uh, and this is mentioned a little bit in the book, is you have three trees going at the same time, right? And so they put a plastic bag around the, the banana that is at the level to be harvested, um, just to indicate to the person who is harvesting that it's like, this is the next one to go. And you have three growing at the same time. You have um, usually one that's just been cut, because after you've harvested its bananas, you chop it so it's not taking nutrients out anymore. So you have one that's been cut, you have a kind of baby one coming up, and then you have the, the current harvest, right? So you have three going at the same time. Um, because this is in a, a tropical climate, uh, and this is an area that used to be a rainforest, uh, the nutrients do get washed out a lot because there's a lot of rain. And as I said, rainforest, that's pretty typical. Uh, so they do require a lot of uh, herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers. And even though they require a lot of that, uh, they get washed out really quick too, right? So it's like lots of expensive chemicals, lots of expensive chemicals washed out. And then this is also why in the same chapter it talks about uh, areas uh, at the end of a river on coast that will have a kind of big dead zone around them because all the stuff that is being washed off uh, doesn't leave room for much oxygen uh, in, in the water that where that is, is released out. Um, and so then, like I said, you have, uh, in this case, you have, have a dude who takes these and put these on here and you just pull them on through to where they're going to be processed. Um, not a super high tech operation. Um, and that's our thing about these plantations. Uh, these ones in, in Costa Rica, they just go on and on and on and on. Like they go as far as the eye can see. Uh, and they're monoculture crop, which means, you know, monoculture, you're planting all of, all of one thing, which is easier to uh, make in higher quantities. But then if you have something like, you know, a disease that only hits that one variety uh, of banana, um, you, you could have huge, huge devasta devastating uh, crop losses, right? Whereas if you had a number of different types of plants or even just different varieties of bananas, uh, if you had one disease hit one, you would still have lots of other crops to kind of use. But again, that is not as easy to make and do at a very large scale, which most, most farming is these days. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit more of Costa Rica. Uh, just kind of give you a little bit of a, a, a sense of place and give you a big picture of, of, of this area. Uh, they're turning increasingly to, to wind power because they, 
are covered with a line of mountains. And so since the air is forced over these mountains, um, and also lots of places like Costa Rica just don't have a lot of fossil fuels. Uh, so if they want energy, if they want to make it locally, um, there's not a lot of alternatives. Uh, they're, they're doing a lot of solar too, but I didn't get any pictures of their, of their solar. Uh, interesting thing about uh, a lot of tropic areas, um, you know, the weather can change quite a bit depending on elevation. And so very often uh, the farming will be done in the lowlands, which is often kind of the weather is a bit unbearable because it's very, very hot. But the worst thing is the humidity. I'm sure you've all experienced some, some heat without humidity being more pleasant than heat with humidity. Um, but you'll see the little road is kind of at the top of little hillsides. These are not far up, but actually does not take going too far up before uh, it dries quite a bit. Uh, this is just some sprawl going on in Costa Rica. Um, this, I know it looks like it's just a bunch of clouds, uh, but whenever I fly over the region, I'm usually able to catch an amount of uh, forest burning off. And so I don't know if you can see in the center here, but they have burning off a, a part of the rainforest for crops. So it's just kind of a a normal thing you'll see in lots of tropical climates. Um, this road uh, is actually newish. Uh, the, the reason you can tell this is a newish road is uh, I mentioned about how the, the soils in the tropics uh, don't have a lot of nutrients, right? Um, well, that's because all the rain, all the rain leaches nutrients out. Um, what all that rain and moisture also does is little minute particles of, of metal in the soil rust. And so the soil will be a reddish color uh, if you ever go and dig in some tropical soil. Uh, this is the coast here. Uh, again, just examples of sprawl that are just kind of happening uh, all over. These circles are central pivot irrigation. Uh, I happen to be here during the dry season, so as you can see, quite a few of them have been left to, to kind of dry out, and they're focusing on just a few different places for uh, for irrigation. Uh, lots of places, even if they're in the tropics, it's not uncommon for them to have a very distinctive dry season, a very distinctive dry season that can last, you know, maybe a month, but maybe six months, kind of depends on the area and where you're going. Uh, so... I think this area is like a couple months of very light, light rain. Um, so this chapter on agriculture talks a lot about uh, sustainability and kind of trying to uh, change the mindset as far as farming and uh, our ecologies. Uh, and our books talk a lot about tourism. So I thought I'd give you an example of what's called ecotourism. Ecotourism is ideally an effort to tour a place uh, in a way that doesn't cause uh, harm to that place, right? And very often that will include things like, um, you know, all the, all the local restaurants might make sure that all of their material and whatnot comes from local producers, giving money to local producers, whereas usually if you travel a hotel chain they'll ship in food and stuff from the U.S. because uh, people kind of want their standard U.S. burger and fries and stuff. Um, so e ecotourism. Uh, when I went to Costa Rica, I went on an uh, ecotourism uh, tour. Um, this was an area that used to be heavily forested, uh, but through time, uh, most members of the family moved away to the cities looking for work. Uh, this is what the, the old house uh, that used to be the, the center of this little community. Uh, on this farm, there's only one elderly woman who, who still uh, owns it, uh, and she signed it over to be uh, a nature preserve. Um, and she still lives on this property, just not there. 
and specifically a nature preserve, uh, it's, a, it's a monkey preserve, a monkey preserve. Um, in the rainforest itself, a lot of the nutrients in the soil uh, just come from the leaves and vegetation that has fallen, uh, but right below that, it can just be rocky or it can be uh, just very sandy. Um, and of course, obviously, if you get rid of the trees, then you're not getting what is the main kind of fertilizer for other plants. This is one of the reasons why traditional crops would mix things. Like in the video you saw, the coffee grows better if there is a rainforest there and it's, it's growing in conjunction with the rainforest. Uh, that's, that's industrial farming just doesn't, that's too much work basically, right? They want to clear cut, have the crops in, have a machine that harvests the crops, be quick, quick and easy and cheap. Uh, a lot of termite mounds in the area. Uh, these are actually worldwide, these are um, a good source of protein. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever eaten termites. Uh, they taste uh, minty. They taste like mint. I don't know why, but they do. You know, well, it's very common uh, for people to eat. You just put your finger on top of it and they'll swarm your finger like it's an attacker, but they don't bite in a way that hurts or anything. And you just Good source of protein. Uh, so this is an area that had been a rainforest, uh, and a lot of it is still forested, but a lot of it was turned over to grazing land. Uh, and this is, as you can see, it's pretty disused grazing land at this point. Uh, a lot of their signage was not was not the best, but if you live in the tropics, things tend to degrade fast. Um, this is an example of how the other, one of the other many reasons to leave trees and forests, uh, especially in the tropics if you're farming, is because they'll hold the landscape together. Uh, you know, the tropics get, in their rainy season, get a lot of rain, uh, and if you cut these trees, uh, well then the, the roots rot, and you have lots of landslides that happen. As I said, this area was uh, um, a preserve, uh, and this is specifically a monkey preserve. Uh, I know that's not a monkey there, but there'll be, there'll be a monkey here. Um, the, the reason, well, so this area is, if a monkey anywhere in Costa Rica is discovered and it's injured, uh, they'll bring it to this little enclosed area that is separated from the other monkeys because it needs to not be injured when it's reintroduced to the other monkeys, because if it's injured, the other monkeys might attack it. Um, and so it spends some time, the, the new monkeys come in here and they, they rehabilitate. Um, the goat is only here uh, to actually, it's supposed to keep the grass down, uh, but the monkey uh, feeds the goat their bananas. So the goat only eats, eats a path to the door uh, doesn't eat any of the other grass that it's supposed to because they've, they've become too friendly. See, like I said, he feeds them his bananas. And... Uh, the guy in the middle there, Marco, he uh, was a colleague of mine. He, he got his degree in geography from the U of M and a lot of people who get their geography degree go into uh, tourism, go into tourism and so he organized tours and whatnot, uh, but because he's a geographer, he spent a lot of a lot of his time taking photos, which is something that that we do. Uh, as I mentioned, this little area is a monkey sanctuary. That's why I have lots of signs saying to not not feed the monkeys. Um, one of the newer things that had has. Um, kind of taken over Costa Rica is uh, emphasis on recycling. Uh, like I said, Costa Rica itself is, has gone through a big changeover in the 30 plus years that I've been going there where uh, you used to go to beaches and whatnot and it would just be covered in just like tourist garbage because people, people just leave garbage everywhere because that's what humans do, I guess. Uh, 
But when places, if they want to change, they have to change culturally. And Costa Rica went on a great big public information campaign talking about how vulnerable their ecosystems are, talking about how, uh, well, if you want to have a sustainable amount of tourists, you can't let the environment be destroyed that they're coming to see, right? Because that is also a thing that tourists do. Tourists will tear, to, tear up an, an environment that they're visiting. Uh, so you have these recycle, recycle uh, bins just kind of everywhere now, uh, and they don't get over full or anything. They, they get emptied out. Um, these are a bunch of students just filling out questionnaires because this was a place that was uh, undergoing a, a special permit for whether it could be supported by the government. Uh, actually, let me go back a couple. The, I mentioned how there was one uh, elderly woman who still lives there, and she's actually here, but she's, she's in a wheelchair, so you can't see her. Uh, but she's also the only one who's allowed to feed the monkeys. And so she just hangs out here and puts up bananas all day, and she feeds the monkeys. No one else, that's why all the signs are there, to not feed the monkeys. But she's allowed to because she's the one who, who gave this land over for, for a preserve. Um... Although this is a preserve and it's against the law to cut down uh, any of the forest or any of the vegetation or hunt any of the animals, there's one plant uh, tree that you're allowed to cut down as much as you would like. Uh, and, and in fact, they encourage it, and that is uh, the bamboo. The bamboo. Uh, people know why they encourage you to cut down the bamboo? Yeah. It grows really fast. Yeah, right? It's from the other side of the planet, right? It's from very different ecosystems where on the other side of the planet, it grows in relative harmony in its ecosystem. Elsewhere, it's considered an invasive species because it does grow so fast that it will squeeze out other local plants, right? Uh, and so even though you have permission and they encourage you to cut down as much as you can, uh, people can't keep up with how much it grows. So there's still plenty around, as you can see, is huge, huge growth of, uh, and you'll see that around the tropics all over the world. Uh, cause during colonialism, uh, a lot of Europeans considered it a good, strong type of tree. And a lot of, a lot of, uh, colonialism was not thinking long-term of the locals, right? And so they didn't care what they would bring in. Um, but as I said, the place, this place is going through a big uh, evaluation. Uh, some of the towns that was uh, Kuru or just that. <clears throat> um, so as I mentioned in this area of the world, uh, you could have very different climates just by changing uh, the elevation that you're at. Um, and what this means is, is yet another reason why uh, historically, traditional and indigenous societies, they would grow a lots of variety of plants together um, rather than this monoculture kind of huge amounts of one crop and that's it. Uh, because that's just part of, part of how hilly and mountainous this, this area is, is it's an advantage because then you could grow lots of different crops. Uh, still, still plenty of logging going on. Uh, this is another area that had been forested, uh, but this had been cut to put in uh, utility utility lines. Um, that's a, actually a way that often invasive species can get through different ecosystems is usually when you put in a power lines into place, you gotta cut down uh, anything that's growing underneath it, right? So you could monitor and if it ever power line gets hit with something or whatever happens, uh, so there's other pressures toward deforesting other than just changing over to agriculture. <clears throat> I know it's weird to have a picture of garbage. Uh, I've, I've traveled to plenty of places in the world where they don't prioritize garbage pickup, so it was actually just nice to be at a place that, that did that. Uh, Costa Rica has a, a fair amount of people who, um, they're, they're tourists, but they will live in Costa Rica for something like three to six months out of the year. So it's kind of a different type of tourism. 
uh, and they'll often just like stay on the beach. Um, there's kind of this, I guess you'd call them kind of a, a hippie uh, counterculture subculture that hangs out in this area a lot. Uh, this is the place I stayed that was again sold as being eco-friendly uh, and what that meant was, uh, well, realistically, they have, like a lot of the normal touristy stuff, you know, tourist uh, food and drink, and you can go scuba and snorkeling. Um, this is just some of the vegetation. Uh, in the tropics, trees often will, will drop their roots from their branches uh, as a way to grow out, because just dropping seeds, there's so much rain, so the seed will just get washed out into the ocean. So this is a bit more of a stable way. And again, the plants in the area are one of the main things stabilizing the land. So this whole area, uh, I'd actually come to this, this specific uh, ecotourism resort a number of times. And historically, this area had all just been sand uh, with not much growing. Uh, but they tried a new system, and I forget the name, uh, but the, the new irrigation system, typically irrigation, you know, you spray water on an area and, and the plants take up the water and use it. Uh, but if you're in a place that has a lot of evaporation and really hot sun, uh, if you have a sprinkler system, a lot of that just gets evaporated immediately. So this system, they actually have a series of hoses uh, that have basically little holes poked in them so that they, I think it's called drip irrigation, but the water drips out slowly and is taken in by the plants and that way you're not really wasting water when you're irrigating and so it takes a lot less. And so because of that, because it took a lot less water, they actually were able to bring back and they have, they have grand plans of bringing back the rainforest entirely. Don't know if they'll be able to do that because uh, a lot of those a lot of the rainforests have complex ecosystems that have a lot of interactions that are difficult to replicate in a quick amount of time. But there's a lot of green. I will give them the credit for that. Um, more bamboo, as you could see. Uh, another area that they had brought back to green. Uh, so eco-friendly, right? Uh, what that means is, I mean, we have a recycling container. Uh, all the electricity here is powered off of uh, solar on the roof. But, you know, you still have a refrigerator and you still have running water and you still have, even if you go to a place that says it's eco-friendly, it doesn't mean it, you're, you're having a really difficult time, you know? It's not like camping. Oh, wait, did I duplicate these slides? Oh, sorry about this. I duplicated a bunch of slides. Okay. Um, Tortuga, this is the main uh, rainforest uh, preserve that, that people go to in Costa Rica. Um, as I mentioned, they put up uh, a whole bunch of billboards in the effort to do this uh, public educational system. As you can see, it's in English, but also in Spanish for, it's for the locals as much as people who are visiting. Uh, and this also actually helped quite a bit because a lot of people just kind of weren't thinking about how they were walking and making sure they weren't walking on life forms that might be at different vulnerable stages of their life. Um, again, more examples of how the roots just hold everything together. Um, like I said, garbage pickup, um, I, I asked, uh, Marco, who was, who was my, my tour guide on this, uh, about why, why the dumpsters would be made out of fence, uh, instead of just kind of like the dumpsters that we have here, he, he being from Minnesota, I w was able to just kind of say, you know, aren't they like that? Uh, and he said it's because of how much rain they get if you had a, if you had the dumpsters like we have here, uh, they would just fill up with water and just become a great big like putrid pile of, of gross and then to, to empty it out into trucks and whatnot. And so although this leaves a lot of kind of gross stuff that's washed underneath, uh, it's more sanitary. Uh, this was the interesting thing about uh, this area here, which is uh, Montezuma. Uh, oh, have people been to Costa Rica? Maybe. Um, 
Well, this area, they had specific laws uh, trying to recapture some of that tourist money um, and use it for local things like this school. Uh, usually tourist money, you go and you're a tourist somewhere, the resort uh, makes the money, and the locals, if they're lucky, maybe a couple of them will work at the resort and make like a small wage. But like huge amounts of money that are made at tourism are mostly sent back out of the country. Um, unless they make laws and put laws in place that say actually this percentage of money brought in but from tourism has to go to this local service, this local cause, garbage pickup or whatever else, right? Or a school in this case. Um, and you know, you have all the local conveniences that you would ever want. Uh, this is little town here, Montezuma. Um, they try as much as possible to have everything locally sourced. Uh, these are some of the locals, like I said, it was kind of, uh, kind of alternative lifestyle people. Um, and the monkeys aren't just in the preserves. The monkeys are kind of all over. They're a bit like squirrels. Like, you'll just see them wherever you go. And they can actually cause quite a bit of havoc and, uh, and no small amount of environmental damage themselves. Um, I took a picture of this because it was one of the few examples I saw of like a traditional sprinkler system. Because uh, most of them, you don't see them because they're underneath underneath the ground. Uh, because it was eco-friendly, if you go to a place that says it's eco-friendly, there's a good chance that means your shower will be outside and it won't be heated. But it's not super cold because the tank is up on the roof and it's warmed up during the day. Uh, but if you take your shower first thing in the morning, it'll be a bit chilly. Uh, and you'll get a little visitor maybe because, you know, if they're outside. Uh, some local restaurants. Like I said, big, big public information campaign to get people recycling. Uh, speaking of squirrels, this was just a local squirrel in Costa Rica. Um, like I said, this whole area being eco-friendly, it had a, a very different mindset. Uh, people were, I don't know if there's a, a, if there's a new phrase for just like hippie type people, right? Who, who want to eat organic and want to be low impact on the landscape. Um, uh, all-terrain vehicles are actually very controversial in places that call themselves eco-friendly because, well, they do allow people to see the sites in an easier way, but they actually tear up the landscapes quite a bit. Uh, and so if you want to, well, they, they usually have paths that you could go on, but people will take them off path because they're all-terrain vehicles, right? Uh, and they're, it's fun to just drive them all over. Uh, but like I said, it's, it's controversial in, in a place that calls itself eco-friendly because of how much they can tear up the landscape. Uh, and this is the same place about 20 years ago. Uh, same street. So you can see it's grown quite a bit since then. All right. Um, oh yeah, I'll show you guys wrap up with some pictures uh, in the rainforest. They have uh, lots of monkeys, lots of sloths. Actually, that's what that is there, a sloth. Uh, again, just showing you how the trees are holding the landscape together. Um, in fact, indigenous populations would specifically have the trees kind of work as a bit of a dam to hold up the landscape. Because, uh, uh, as I said, otherwise you get a lot of rain uh, and it will wash out. Uh, but that is a, is, it's very labor intensive to maintain a landscape like that. But that's how farming used to be. Right, see these trees, just even if they're dispersed, the roots are still holding the ground all together. Uh, this tree here had died, uh, and so its roots were not holding this area together, and so areas along the river were sometimes degrading. All right, so they try to put up concrete barriers to, to keep the land up, because the trees aren't quite there for it yet. Some areas there, there were still trees that were 
on the shores, creating uh, little dams so that there wasn't soil loss and degradation. Uh, like this tree here, you can see how it's fanned out quite a bit and it's kind of holding the landscape up. Some of the older trees were still there. Uh, and these are interwoven with each other. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see what's the creature that's there. Slight, slight zoom in. Um, another slob. Uh, again, more of the root systems holding the landscape together. Uh, another example of, of, you know, power line, got to cut through for access, but that is a way that invasive species can get one from one ecosystem to another. Uh, a lot of the housing, as I said, this was the dry season, so the water was at a low point, but a lot of the housing they put up on stilts. And if you ever wondered why, it's because, well, when the water level goes up, You'll get flooded out if you don't do that. Um, the other option is to uh, have your home be a boat, because then whatever the water level, it'll just rise or sink, right? Depending on. Uh, so there's quite a few of that. It's going up river here. Uh, so we got further into the country. See the housing is changing a bit. All right. Well, we are out of time, so I'll keep up on agriculture next time. If you haven't started reading that chapter.